Welcome to Hub History, the show where we share our favorite stories from Boston history. This is episode 106, Miss Mac, from Wellesley to the Waves. Hi, I'm Nikki. And I'm Jake. This week, we're going to discuss the women who served in World War II in a Navy outfit called the Waves. More particularly, we're going to discuss the commanding officer of the Waves, a woman named Mildred McAfee. Later, Mildred McAfee Horton. When the war started, she was the president of Wellesley College. Before it was over, she would be the first woman to be commissioned as an officer in the U.S. Navy, commanding a force of nearly 100,000 people. But before we talk about Mildred McAfee Horton, it's time to take a look at this week's featured historic site and upcoming event. Our show this week has a strong tie to Wellesley, both the town and the school. So we wanted to feature a historic site with a connection to Wellesley also. Luckily, we have a spot that's linked to both Wellesley and Boston. Over the centuries, one of Boston's biggest challenges was finding a fresh drinking water supply. In the earliest days of English settlement, John Winthrop's Puritans moved from Charlestown to Boston in 1630 because Boston had more fresh water springs. Demand soon outstriped supply, however, and those springs were quickly insufficient for the growing population. Residents dug wells, but they often yielded brown, fetid water contaminated by human and animal waste. They built cisterns and gathered rainwater, but this rarely produced enough usable water. In 1796, a group of investors bought the water rights to Jamaica Pond and built wooden pipes to carry the water into Boston. This measure helped, but the water still wasn't enough for the growing city and the reservoir was too low-lying for the water to reach elevated areas in Boston. In the 1840s, the city finally began taking the water problem seriously under the leadership of Mayor Josiah Quincy Jr., who was actually the fourth of six prominent Josiah Quincys, and the second of three to be elected mayor of Boston. In 1848, Cosituate Aqueduct opened, bringing enormous quantities of water from the Cosituate Reservoir. The occasion was marked by a huge celebration on Boston Common, with cosituate water shooting 80 feet in the air over the frog pond. Of course, the city continued growing, but this time, the water system had been planned to grow alongside the population. In the 1860s, the city built a reservoir at Chestnut Hill to have local water storage. In the 1870s, an aqueduct was constructed to bring water from the Sudbury River in Framingham to the Chestnut Hill Reservoir. It was followed by water from Mystic Lake, then the Wachusett Reservoir, then eventually, in the 20th century, the Quabbin. The Sudbury Aqueduct runs for about 16 miles through Sherburne, Natick, Wellesley, Needham, and Newton. At the town line between Natick and Wellesley, just across the Charles River from the Elm Bank Reservation, the aqueduct has to cross the low valley of the Wabin Brook, named after one of the first Nipbuck sachems to convert to Christianity. An elegant nine-arch granite bridge was constructed across the brook in 1876. It clips the corner of both the town of Wellesley and the Wellesley campus. Today, the Wabin arches are part of a network of aqueduct trails that span Wellesley and Newton. You can access them by kayak or canoe from the Charles River, or you can incorporate them into a hike or walk along the aqueduct trails. We'll post a link to trail maps and photos in this week's show notes. And for our upcoming event this week, we have pirates. We know that you love pirates because our most popular episode ever remains our pirate episode. So this should be right up your alley. On November 19th, the Massachusetts Historical Society is hosting author Eric J. Dolan. Dolan wrote a definitive history of the golden age of piracy called Black Flags, Blue Waters. He covers the same era that our podcast did, but his book goes beyond just Boston. And, of course, he's an actual expert, unlike us. Here's what the MHS says you can expect at the event. Set against the backdrop of the age of exploration, Black Flags, Blue Waters reveals the dramatic history of American piracy's golden age spanning the late 1600s through the early 1700s, when lawless pirates plied the coastal waters of North America and beyond. 
Eric J. Dolan illustrates how American colonists at first supported these outrageous pirates in an early display of solidarity against the crown, and then violently opposed them. The talk will be held at 6 p.m. on Monday, November 19th, with a reception beginning at 5.30. There's a $10 fee, and advanced registration is required. We'll have a link to the event registration page in this week's show notes. And now it's time for this week's main topic. Your hosts are out of town this week, traveling and taking advantage of the Veterans Day long holiday weekend. Veterans Day, of course, started out as Armistice Day, which commemorated the end of the First World War in 1918. The armistice with Germany went into effect on the 11th day of the 11th month at 11.11. The following year, President Wilson announced the new holiday, saying in part, The war showed us the strength of great nations acting together for high purposes, and the victory of arms foretells the enduring conquests which can be made in peace when nations act justly and in furtherance of the common interests of men. To us in America, the reflections of Armistice Day will be filled with solemn pride in the heroism of those who died in the country's service, and with gratitude for the victory, both because of the thing from which it has freed us and because of the opportunity it has given America to show her sympathy with peace and justice in the councils of nations. Since 1954, the holiday has been Veterans Day, meant to honor the service of all American veterans, so we're bringing you the story of a veteran this week. It's a story of World War II, but in a way, it began during World War I. When the war began, the U.S. Navy had to quickly upgrade from 300 ships to over 1,000. They were chronically shorthanded, leaving the brass scrambling to figure out how to fill the ranks. One crazy idea was to enlist women, but the active-duty military was restricted to men. One word in the Navy Act of 1916, however, left a loophole. Captain Joy Bright Hancock, who served in the Navy in both world wars, recalled how the Navy decided to recruit Yeomanettes in this 1974 interview. Our Secretary of the Navy at that time was Josephus Daniels. Uh, He didn't cut the corners, but he found a very easy and practical way, gentlemen, to do things. And uh, when we found that uh, civil service couldn't supply uh, the number of women they wanted in the clerical ratings, uh, he said, well, is there any reason why they shouldn't be sworn into the uh, Naval Reserve? And uh, his aides looked up the law, the legislation, and much to their surprise, they found that someone had neglected to write in the word male into the legislation. So Mr. Daniel said, all right, bring in the women. And that was it. Before the war was over, 11,000 women were, to quote the village people, in the Navy. They filled positions on land, mostly clerical, that would free enlisted men for shipboard duty. However, when the war ended, our society expected them to take off their uniforms and don their aprons again. Twenty-four years after the Yeomanettes of the Great War had been sent home, the country came calling again. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, the nation found itself again in the position of quickly scaling up the Navy to a wartime footing. As legislation introduced by President Roosevelt wound its way through Congress that would authorize the recruitment of women into the U.S. Navy, Barnard Professor Elizabeth Raynard turned her attention to what the new corps should be called. Joy Hancock explains why clever branding was needed. And uh, as far as the Navy was concerned, there, except for the very few older officers, uh, no one seemed to remember that women had already served and uh, the experiment had been carried out in World War I. Uh, very early in the program, There arose a need for some sort of a catchy thing. We tried saying the Women's Reserve or the Naval Reserve or the women enrolled for this, that, and the other. And finally, um, among the various suggestions that were given was one by Lieutenant Elizabeth Raynard. Uh, She's given credit for this this, um, uh, slogan or acronym. Uh, because it was, it smacked of the Navy in itself, waves. And she based that on the women accepted for volunteer emergency service. And that proved to be uh, a very catchy one for Republic relations purposes and also in recruiting. Renard would say, 
I realized there were two letters that had to be in it, W for women and V for volunteer, because the Navy wants to make it clear that this is voluntary service and not a drafted service. So I played with those two letters and the idea of the C and finally came up with Women Accepted for Volunteer Emergency Service. Waves. I figured the word emergency would comfort the older admirals because it implies there were only a temporary crisis and won't be around for keeps. As the waves began to seem like a reality, the question of leadership arose. In a 1998 profile of McAfee in the Journal of Presbyterian History, Elizabeth Hendricks wrote, When World War II broke out and the Navy decided to recruit women for the first time, they looked for a woman college president to head the operation. They wanted someone whose experience in working with young women would lend credibility to the endeavor. On July 30th, 1942, FDR signed Public Law 689, officially creating a women's branch of the U.S. Navy Reserve. The Navy quickly formed a civilian advisory board to determine what types of work could be performed by women, how they should be recruited, and who should lead them. The board found a woman college president who would bring credibility to the waves in Wellesley, Massachusetts, as Joy Hancock later recalled in her book, Lady in the Navy, A Personal Reminiscence. One of the notable acts of this council was its selection of Miss Mildred McAfee, the president of Wellesley College, as director of the Waves. Dean Gildersleeve, at the request of Rear Admiral Jacobs, accepted the task of persuading the reluctant Wellesley trustees to release the vivacious, able president for service in the Navy. The judgment of the council was magnificently upheld by the outstanding job Miss McAfee performed. She brought not only prestige to the entire program, but also her gift for getting along with people, even with certain recalcitrants, salty officers who ultimately came to see the great service women could perform. Since the highest rank or grade that could be held by a woman, in accordance with legislation as finally enacted, was that of lieutenant commander, Miss McAfee was commissioned in that rank as the first director of the waves. She was the first woman officer ever sworn into the reserve of the Navy, for at that time, women in the nurse corps of the Navy held only temporary rank. It seems that Mildred McAfee was almost literally born into the dual worlds of academia and women's leadership, and she came to value women's leadership through her Christian faith. She was born on May 12, 1900, on the campus of Park College in Parkville, Missouri a Presbyterian college that her grandfather had founded, and where her father, Cleland McAfee, was then serving as dean. As Mildred grew up, Cleland McAfee was deeply involved in the struggle to give women more leadership roles in the Presbyterian church, including introducing measures that would have allowed women to be ordained as ministers. Those efforts wouldn't come to fruition until much later, but they must have influenced Mildred McAfee's worldview, as she grew up valuing public service education, and seeing the church as a venue through which women in particular could be of service and leadership. Speaking at Wellesley in 1975, she stressed how central her faith was to her life. You should know that I speak as a minister's granddaughter, the daughter of a Presbyterian minister who was also a professor of theology. I am the sister-in-law of four ministers, one a Methodist, another a Baptist, the niece of at least five Presbyterian ministers, the aunt of five ministerial nephews, two of them professors in great universities, the mother-in-law of a church historian and New Testament scholar in another university, an Episcopalian. And most significant, I speak as the wife of a United Church of Christ minister whose last professional position was that of the dean of the Harvard Divinity School. How could I escape an awareness of the importance of religion? In 1935, the sixth president of Wellesley College announced her intent to retire the following year. President Ellen Fitz Pendleton had been the first Wellesley graduate to become president of the school, so a nationwide search was initiated to find a suitable candidate to follow in her considerable footsteps. In 1936, the search committee found their candidate, who was at the time dean of women at Oberlin College in Ohio. They announced that she was a woman with intellectual honesty, leadership, tolerance, savoir-faire, sympathetic understanding of youth, vision, and a sense of humor. 
Mildred McAfee was a graduate of Vassar, and she had built an impressive academic resume. Starting in 1923 as acting professor of economics and sociology at Tuscaloom College in Tennessee, even before earning her master's in sociology from the University of Chicago in 1928. In 1926, she moved to Center College as dean of women and professor of sociology. Before moving on to Oberlin, she served briefly as the executive director of Vassar's Alumni Association. Despite all her academic experience, she was still very young to serve as president of a prominent university. A May 1936 article in the Harvard Crimson introduced her to Boston academia. The news of Mildred McAfee's appointment, which reached the slender, curly-topped educator just three days after her 36th birthday, was as exciting to Vassar as to Wellesley women. The Vassar class of 1920 recalls Mildred McAfee as a fairly good hockeyist and basketballer who was glib enough at debating to help defeat Wellesley on one occasion. As a matter of fact, Vassarette McAfee is something of an academic cosmopolite. She was born on the campus of Park College in Parkville, Missouri, founded by her grandfather. After Vassar, she made a grand tour of Eastern and Midwestern male and female institutions, teaching economics and sociology, and wound up at Oberlin in 1934. Her entry in the Encyclopedia of Vassar Alumni says, As president of Wellesley, McAfee had the opportunity and the authority to put to work what she had learned from four different institutions of higher learning. Her presidency emphasized truth as the greatest and most precious object of scholarly pursuit. McAfee also defended the validity of a liberal arts education against accusations of impracticality and indulgence during the Great Depression. She considered it valuable in building the power of the individual and in shaping a greater internal and external awareness of the world. McAfee subscribed to the belief that the liberal arts cannot be taken as preparation for a career, but as preparation for life. As someone especially concerned with women's education, she considered this type of learning invaluable towards social equality. Now this able administrator and charismatic leader was being asked to leave the university and join the military. Instead of resigning her post at Wellesley, as you might expect, the lieutenant commander whose Navy nickname would be Miss Mack took a leave of absence. For the duration of the war years, she'd be referred to as Wellesley's President on Leave, and both institutions showed a great deal of leeway, giving her the flexibility to continue attending to occasional pressing college business in Massachusetts, even as the bulk of her time was spent in Washington, pulling together a brand new military unit. Joy Hancock's Lady in the Navy recalls some of the early administrative and cultural challenges that Miss Mack faced. The director plunged at once into the maelstrom of details the new program involved. Her initiative was encouraged by bureau officials, who, in the beginning, were only too relieved to have the woman's viewpoint on such matters as recruiting, housing, training, etc. of the Women's Reserve. But their interest was not focused intensely on these problems, since the Bureau was being reorganized and their preoccupation with this matter precluded any concentrated concern for what was quantitatively a minor program. Small wonder, then, that with this casual handling of the creation of the new office, Miss McAfee and her staff shortly ran into a substantial amount of friction. This was clearly no fault of hers. No attempt had been made by the Bureau of Personnel to fit the Women's Reserve into the patterns and traditions of the existing organization of the Navy. The damaging consequences of this failure ran deep and were to be a continuing source of difficulty during the first 15 months of the program. As the organizational wrinkles were ironed out, a recruiting call went out across the land. We're proud of our first assignment, and we're taking turns in manning the control tower. We're only a few of the 5,000 waves already signed up. But the Navy says we're doing such a good job that they want 30,000 more. Already we've learned how to help instruct pilots with the link trainer. Some of us carry last-minute sealed orders to the pilot. So come on, girls, and join the wave. As young women streamed in from around the country, enlisted waves went through two months of recruit training on the campus of Iowa State Teachers College. 
After that, they were sent for specialized training at stations on the campuses of Oklahoma A&M, Georgia State College for Women, Burdett College in Boston, and many more around the country. An officer candidate school was established at Smith College in Northampton, Mass. Doris Weatherford described how Miss Mack leveraged her academic experience in American Women During World War II, an encyclopedia. Her academic background showed in the somewhat cerebral image that the waves soon established. McAfee's familiarity with college systems was no doubt the reason that the WAVE's first unit was located at Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. Eventually, WAVE's received their basic training at almost a dozen colleges. It was not a pattern emulated by any other military unit, but it typified McAfee's common-sense approach. Naval bases were tremendously short of space, while colleges were under-enrolled because of the war. Her style differed from that of most other commanders, too, in that she sought relative comfort for her women. While others were eager to prove that women could take the ordeals of marching and other military maneuvers, McAfee preferred a low-key approach that simply got the job done without superfluous military tradition. She gave her waves a comparatively degree of personal freedom, saw that they were assigned to military occupational specialties that suited the individual, and treated them with respect and collegiality. Before long, Lieutenant Commander McAfee found herself in the familiar position of addressing a graduating class. But instead of a crowd of young women in caps and gowns, she gazed out at columns of uniformed women standing smartly at attention. Your real work in the Navy begins today. Remember that the men you released for combat duty at sea are relying on your reliability, accuracy, resourcefulness, and zeal on shore. The Navy and the nation count on you. Though she rarely said so publicly, Miss Mack believed that military service was a way to level the playing field between the sexes. At an October 1942 dinner where Lieutenant Commander McAfee's comments were held off the record, Lieutenant Mary Agnes Brown of the Women's Army Corps said, I confidently believe that a new era in human relations is unfolding, that men and women will live and work together with greater understanding and respect, and that they will attempt to solve their problems by intelligent teamwork, unfettered by the prejudices of the past. In the 1940s, not everyone was as confident in the abilities of women as Mildred McAfee and Mary Agnes Brown were. A June 1943 Associated Press article describes how McAfee went to Capitol Hill and tangled with Senator David Walsh of Massachusetts in an attempt to expand the duties waves were allowed to perform. In the presence of Lieutenant Commander Mildred H. McAfee of the Waves, Chairman Walsh of the Senate Naval Affairs Committee declared bluntly today that the Navy, to my mind, is a male organization. The smartly uniformed woman officer appeared before the committee to urge passage of a bill which would remove present restrictions against sending the waves overseas. It was clear from the outset of the hearing that the legislation, already approved by the House, faces a stormy course in the Senate committee. Senator Walsh told the first witness, Rear Admiral Randall Jacobs, Chief of Naval Personnel, that historically the Navy had always been a man's outfit and continued... You told us last year when urging passage of the original wave bill that you wanted women only to replace Navy men in this country and did not want to send them overseas. Now, apparently, we're reaching a stage where all barriers are to be removed and they can be sent anywhere. The chairman and other members of the committee were equally cool toward another provision of the bill, which would raise the highest permissible rank for wave officers from lieutenant commander to captain. Commander McAfee testified that many of her girls were eager to share the dangers of overseas duty and released for service at sea those officers and men now assigned to desk duty in London, the Canal Zone, Hawaii, and elsewhere. Under the bill, women could not be assigned to duty on warships or combat aircraft. Senator Walsh would not get his way. Though waves were not approved for overseas service, in 1944 they were allowed to serve in Alaska and Hawaii. Even many critics were eventually won over by the fact that the waves came in and simply, quietly and efficiently got things done. 
as women have been doing since the beginning of time. Women did administrative and clerical work, acted as air traffic controllers, radio men, and parachute riggers. Some officers were assigned as chaplains, doctors, and attorneys. Mathematician Grace Hopper, who will get her own episode one day, was assigned to Harvard, where she designed some of the first digital computers in history. Enlisted women might work in aeronautics, as machinists, or as couriers and drivers. Speaking of drivers, my grandmother enlisted as an army nurse in 1944, and while she had many positive experiences, also experienced a lot of sexism and trial and tribulation as a result thereof. And on one particular day when she was going through the training, the task that day was to learn the basics of driving. So all of the women are going to learn how to drive Jeeps. And the officer who was in charge of this training made it very clear what his opinions were on women learning how to drive, um, namely that they were incapable of learning how to do so. And so when Graham's time comes, you know, she's at the front of the line, gets in behind the driver's seat, and uh, she just guns it. She grew up on a farm. She had already done a lot of driving by this time. That Jeep was nothing for Graham. And when I would hear her tell the story, I always imagined this as just a Blues Brothers car chase, except they weren't chasing anyone, but just zipping through the course, up on two tires, zipping around the corners. You know, at one point, he's got one hand bracing his hat on his head, and the other hand is uh, braced against the ceiling of the Jeep, and they're jouncing along. Finally, they come to the end of the course, and he says, Jeez, Yike, why didn't you tell me you know how to drive? And she said, well, you didn't ask me. Though the legislation authorizing the recruitment of women didn't have anything to say about race, the Waves were a whites-only organization at first. Navy Secretary Knox was reported to have said that black women would be enlisted over his dead body. Ironic, then, that his successor as secretary, James Forrestal, submitted a proposal to integrate the Waves almost before Knox's body was cold. Black women couldn't enlist in the Waves until two years after their founding. When Roosevelt's Republican challenger Thomas Dewey made segregation in the Navy a campaign issue, FDR issued an order to begin recruiting black women on October 19, 1944. In the end, only 70 enlisted black women and two officers served by the end of the war, as opposed to nearly 100,000 white officers and enlisted women. Also in 1944, the cap on rank was raised somewhat. In November, Mildred McAfee was promoted to captain. This made her the highest-ranking female officer to have served in the U.S. Navy up to that point. However, as Weatherford points out, Although McAfee commanded close to 100,000 women, she never rose above captain, a rank that sometimes went to men who led as few as 500 sailors. When Japan surrendered to the United States on September 2, 1945, the war was officially over. If there was no more national emergency, officials believed that there was no more need for women accepted for volunteer emergency service. By October 1st, five separation centers around the country opened to begin demobilizing the women of the waves. In 1946, ten more centers opened, processing tens of thousands of women out of the service. At the time, there was a widespread belief that the days of women in the Navy were at an end. A small corps of women remained in the service to assist with the overall demobilization effort, drawing down the Navy's ranks to peacetime levels. However, to widespread surprise, Congress passed a bill in 1948 authorizing women to serve in the Navy permanently. Their roles would be heavily restricted to non-combat positions for another quarter century, but women had a foot in the door, and their service, described by Navy Secretary Forrestal as, in the highest tradition of the naval service, would continue. Captain McAfee's service, however, would not continue. She retired from the Navy in 1945. She was the first woman to receive the Navy's Distinguished Service Medal 
and she was also awarded the American Campaign Medal and the World War II Victory Medal. Upon her retirement, Time magazine put her on the cover in August of 1945 and lauded her achievements. Her 1994 New York Times obituary said, After the war, Mrs. Horton continued to be an outspoken advocate for improving the position of women in the military. In one speech, she criticized the folly of a national policy of discussing manpower in a national emergency as though it were only male power, adding that such an attitude put women in the category of a national luxury instead of a national asset. She was no longer the president on leave of Wellesley, returning to active duty as the regular president of the university before 1945 was over. The 1998 Hendricks profile notes that in August of that year, she surprised the campus by announcing her marriage to the Reverend Dr. Douglas Horton, a 54-year-old widower with four children who was then serving as minister of the General Council of Congregational Christian Churches. The two first met at Wellesley when he came to preach and visit two of his daughters who were students there. When Miss McAfee began working in Washington, he dropped by her office and asked her to look over a paper he had written. She later declared that she did not know his motives were actually social. Douglas Horton was one of the leaders of the Congregational Church during the period of mergers and consolidations that led to the formation of today's United Church of Christ. At the time he married Mildred, he was dean of the Harvard Divinity School, a position he would remain in until he retired in 1960. During her post-war tenure at Wellesley, Mildred McAfee Horton removed questions about race and religious affiliation from the undergraduate application, hoping to level the playing field somewhat for minority applicants. Hendricks remind us that, Even with someone widely regarded as a national leader and a hero to women at the helm, progress toward racial equity in college admissions was not a steady march forward. Nevertheless, her efforts were not always successful. Her religious conviction that all men are brothers, not that they ought to be, but that they are, influenced her goal of moving toward full integration at the college. She wanted to establish a scholarship fund for black women to encourage them to come to Wellesley, but she ran into major opposition when she attempted to raise funds and persuade the college to seek out black candidates. In 1949, Mildred retired from Wellesley. She served on various corporate and nonprofit boards, becoming the first woman on the boards of RCA, the New York Public Library, and New York Life Insurance. However, she would later write that she often felt like a token in these roles in secular civilian life. After her academic career was over, she was drawn into church leadership, challenging the Protestant faith she loved to provide more active roles for women. In 1950, she would become the founding vice president of the National Council of Churches. A 1958 paper entitled Second Class Citizens or Partners in Policy demonstrates the transformation of the church that she hoped to spark. The crucial question about the place of women in the church is whether or not the church will accept the pattern of the secular society, with which most women are fully content, or will take the lead within its own life, demonstrating the truth of its age-old teaching that human personality is of ultimate worth, whether it be male or female. After Douglas retired, the couple moved in 1963 from Boston to Randolph, New Hampshire, where Mildred served as president of the Board of Trustees of the University of New Hampshire. She would spend the rest of her career, especially after her husband's death in 1968, in various church leadership roles. She died in 1994 at the age of 94. McAfee Hall at Wellesley and Horton Hall at UNH are named after her. To learn more about Captain Mildred McAfee Horton, check out this week's show notes at hubhistory.com slash 106. We'll have videos of the waves in action, as well as a longer portion of that 1974 interview with Captain Joy Bright Hancock and the 1969 interview with Captain Mildred McAfee Horton. We'll link to Joy Hancock's book, Lady in the Navy, the article by Elizabeth Hendricks in the Journal of Presbyterian History, and the other articles we quoted from in the episode. 
And, of course, we'll have links to information about this week's featured historic site and upcoming event. We got some fun listener feedback this week. During our episode about polio and the iron lung, we quoted from an interview with Dr. Mark Rockoff, who is vice chairman of the Department of Anesthesiology, Critical Care, and Pain Medicine at Boston Children's Hospital, and a professor of anesthesia at Harvard Medical School. Imagine our surprise when, a few days after we released the episode, we received an email from Dr. Rockoff. Congratulations on your recent podcast about the iron lung, and I was surprised to hear myself being quoted in it. FYI, Boston Children's Hospital has a restored iron lung on display in one of its research buildings. In addition, we have lent another one to Boston's Museum of Science where it is currently on display. The exhibit there includes a short video that illustrates how the iron lung functions and shows a healthy volunteer inside one of these machines. I hope you will find this information useful. If we were surprised to hear from him, imagine how surprised he must have been to be innocently listening to a podcast and hear himself quoted. In a follow-up, he reassured us that we didn't embarrass ourselves on the subject. We're always worried when a real expert hears the show. We'll include a link to information about the iron lung on display at the Museum of Science, as well as a video about polio and the iron lung that Dr. Rockoff contributed to in this week's show notes. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at podcast at hubhistory.com. You can call and leave a voicemail at 617-383-9255, and we might just play it on the show. We're Hub History on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Or you can go to hubhistory.com and click on the Contact Us link. While you're on the site, hit the subscribe link and be sure that you never miss an episode. If you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, please consider writing us a brief review. It's still the best way to help others discover the show. That's all for now. We'll be back next week. <laughs>